we might call America the land of the free and the home of the advertisements. Uh, if you had to guess how many ads you saw, like online, on billboards, on the street, in, in the newspaper, in the past 24 hours, what do you think that number would be? According to some sources, the average American sees between 4,000 and 10,000 advertisements every single day. <laughs> if my math is right, that means if you live in a big city and you're closer to the 10 rather than the 4, and you're awake for 16 hours, every 5.77 seconds, someone is saying, look, no look at this, no click on this. 5.77 seconds. Just think of all the ads that we see. You know, you, you drive down the interstate, there's a billboard, another billboard. You take a turn, there's a billboard behind a billboard. Across from this other billboard, there's, you know, blinking signs and restaurant signs. There's scrolling signs and LED signs. There's, you know, revolving signs that we see on billboards these days. Uh, you, you go to grocery shopping and you pick up the, the shopping ad. And then sometimes, have you ever seen a shopping cart that has like an ad on top of it? Um, I once saw one of those little plastic dividers to keep your groceries from my groceries that had little ads on top of that too. I think in social media, there are Facebook ads. We have to watch ads before our YouTube videos. There's ads in between Spotify songs. There's pop-up ads you have to click off of. Uh, the average website kind of looks like a, a NASCAR driver's outfit, right? Just <laughs> There's ads plastered on the top and down each side, and sometimes I get frustrated because I just want to read an article without 17 ads to get through. But that's life in America. Every six seconds, someone wants our attention, and they'll pay big money to get it. A couple weeks ago, our church decided to partner with, with Time of Grace Media Ministry uh, to rent five billboards in the Appleton area. And, and at first, I was really excited about that. You know, a new and fresh way to get people's attention and maybe to get them to, to come and listen in and most importantly, to hear about Jesus. But I was excited for about this long and then I got nervous for about this long because I realized I speed past hundreds of billboards every day and pay them zero attention. They say, what, you get about six seconds that a person sees a billboard. You can't put more than seven words on it or people don't have time to read it and process at 72 miles an hour. So what, what in the world are we going to put to get people to look? And then to look again and then to look into it. Like a, a Bible passage? That has to be less than seven words? Like a, a picture of Pastor Michael, you know, like a, a real estate agent out there, would, would that get people's attention? What, what in the world would we say to get people to look and to keep looking? I made me think a couple years ago when my soccer teammate said, hey, hey Mike, I, I saw your cousin on a billboard. I said, my cousin? What, where? He said, well, right there on the interstate, going north to Green Bay. I said, no, she's not. I drive that road all the time. And so after the game, I went on that road, and guess what? There's my cousin. Like... <laughs> massive version of my cousin and I zipped past her without even looking and without even noticing because uh, that's life in America. It, it, it's hard to know where to look and it's hard to look one place for very long. And, and yet here's what I know about you, uh, what I know about all of us, that the places we look will affect us. The stuff for the next seven days that you pay attention to will affect your thoughts, your heart, and your faith. They'll touch your emotions and your spirituality. Whatever you choose to look at, in whatever direction, whoever gets your attention will capture your heart. Um, I bet you've experienced this, right? Like, um, if you spend all day just like scrolling through the news stories and because people pay attention to like car wrecks and train crashes, you know, it's easy to click on all the stories about school shootings and church shootings and synagogue shootings and, you know, more corruption and false charges and all the stuff that feels like that, the headline news. And I bet after like an hour of that, if that's all you pay attention to, it will affect you. You feel hopeless, maybe distressed, maybe depressed, maybe angry, but it will affect you. If you're in a politics and, you know, you just sit down in front of like the, the one cable news show or the other one and there's just like accusations and people pointing fingers and defending themselves or saying, no, it's your fault, like th that will get to you. Um, you won't turn the TV off and, and feel more at peace or, or more hopeful or more joyful because what you pay attention to will get to your heart. 
which is why I'm really glad that you're here today. Because today, unless you're scrolling through your phone while I'm talking, I hope you're not, <laughs> we're going to pay attention for way more than 5.77 seconds to Jesus. And thankfully, we're not in our cars. We're not going to zip by the billboard that's about Jesus. We're going to stop for about 20 to 30 minutes and just pay attention to who Jesus is. Because today, in a very little chunk of the Bible that I want to teach to you, there's going to be two big billboards that God wants you to see. And they're both really about the identity of Jesus. One was put up by Jesus' relative, a guy named John the Baptist. And the second was put up by God himself, the Holy Spirit. And my hope is that if you pay enough attention to these two uh, images of who Jesus actually was, the real Jesus, it will change you. And it will give you peace and it will give you life. It will give you hope and it will give you freedom. So that's our goal today. One small chunk of the Bible, two pictures of Jesus to find the one life that God intended us to have. So uh, let's look together at John chapter 1, where we find these words. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. (laughs) So John the Baptist takes out this billboard and he wants you to know that Jesus is a big deal. He kind of speaks in a riddle at the end there. He says, a man, that's Jesus, who comes after me. Um, Jesus was born after John. Uh, He started teaching publicly after John. And yet, John says, he has surpassed me. He's more important than me, more glorious. You should pay attention to him, not me. Why? Because he was before me. Which would be kind of confusing, right? If, if, If John was born here and Jesus was born after him, how could Jesus be before him? And the only logical answer is because Jesus is God. (laughs) He was born after him in this life, but Jesus as the eternal son of God has always existed. He's really, really important. And here's why. John says, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's John's billboard. In fact, if you're taking notes in your program today, I'd love for you to write that down. John simply says, look, the lamb. Think about that. Pay attention to that, and you will find freedom in life. Which, not to be critical of John, but that doesn't seem like great marketing, does it? (laughs) I mean, if I, like, went to a farm and brought a lamb and took him out on stage here and said, Look, a lamb! Go in peace! (laughs) It just wouldn't work for you, right? We could could take a field trip to a farm, but it wouldn't help our faith very much. And that's because for us, lambs aren't that inspiring, right? They don't empower us. Uh, Have you ever seen a a high school choose a lamb as its mascot? It never happens. Like, they would get slaughtered every Friday night in the football game, right? Sorry, that's a really bad lamb joke. (laughs) Now, for us, like 21st century America, like lambs uh, don't inspire us. They don't empower us. But back in first century Israel, they absolutely would have. Uh, In fact, if you're familiar with the teaching of the Bible, you might know that lambs were one of the most powerful, powerful pictures to teach us about God. These days when we come to worship and we come to a church, we we might sing a few songs, uh, we might listen to a few passages, we might say a few prayers. But but do you know what people did back in Jesus' day? They would come to church with a lamb. And it was like this shocking billboard from God about the seriousness of, of sin but also the boundless patience of God's love. With that little lamb, uh, God would teach you in in an instant that he was a God who was both full of grace and truth. That he takes sin way more seriously than than we do. But his love is also massively beyond any version we've seen of it on this earth. Here's what would happen. Um, If you had been like jealous during the week, you had seen the house your neighbor was living in or the relationship your, your sister had, you were jealous. Or you're like super critical and instead of encouraging people with your words, you kind of nitpick and find the thing that was wrong. Uh, if you fell in, into an addiction and had lost your self-control, uh, if you had said something in the heat of the moment that was really angry and unloving and unkind, if, if you had sinned, you would come to church with a lamb. And you'd hand it over to the pastor, t- to the priest, and he would smile And then he'd take out a knife and he'd stab it. 
And he cut open its windpipe, and the lamb would just bleed, like crimson red all over its beautiful white fur. And, and you would watch, because that was God's ad. He wanted to say, if, if you think jealousy or a lack of self-control or anger or lust or greed or a critical word, if that's not a big deal because, you know, everyone does it, not to God. God is good. And that makes sin really, really bad. And as you would watch that sacrificial lamb bleed, then the priest would look up and do you know what he would say to you? Go in peace. You can go. But first he would bless you. He'd say, wait, wait, wait. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and and give you peace. So go. And, And you'd walk away unscathed. The lamb would be dead, but you'd be alive. The lamb was full of blood, but you would leave simply blessed. Because that was God's ad. He wanted to visually depict some way to show that sin is really, really bad to God. We have to take it seriously. And yet, God's heart is so merciful and so forgiving and so patient and so kind. So think of what it must have sounded like in that culture back in the first century where Jesus shows up, just a normal guy in sandals with a beard, and John says, look, 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 the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't take away like this guy's sin or those people's sins or or this nation's sins. He takes away the sin of the world. Uh, Recently, I I heard a pastor preach on the same passage and I remember what he said. He he said in the Old Testament during the Passover celebration, one lamb would forgive the sins of a family. And once a year during the Jewish Day of Atonement, it was one sacrifice that would forgive the sins of all the Jewish people. But when Jesus showed up, John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God, one sacrifice who will take away the sins of the world. (laughs) Which is what I thought about uh, last Thursday. Uh, Last Thursday, a member of our church texted me and and said I had to get to a local high school by 3.30. And I showed up and something amazing happened. Uh, Two young men, one from China and one from Vietnam, were baptized. And even though they weren't born in the same country that I was, even though their native language was very different than the one I grew up with, they had to celebrate the grace of Jesus. And why? Because Jesus is not the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of white people or American people or English-speaking people. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The entire world. The Americans and Asians, Brazilians and Mexicans, the the German, the the Italians, the the Chinese, the Czech, it doesn't matter where you're from, where you were born, the the color of your skin, around the throne of Jesus are people from every tribe and nation and language and tongue because Jesus himself rose from the dead and he said, go and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, it doesn't matter where you're from, you can look at Jesus. And just as importantly, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've done. You can look at Jesus. There's this great picture. Uh, my favorite Christian artist drew of this passage. There's Jesus, the Lamb of God. And around him is like swirling all, all the messed up stuff of this world. Like all, all the sin, all the, all the struggle, all the ugliness that happens on earth. It swirls around until it becomes the blade that sacrifices the Lamb of God. And when I see this picture, it it reminds me that no matter how dark and how ugly the things that we've done, we can still look to Jesus. So please, 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 do not let the the devil mess with God's marketing campaign. John the Baptist paid for this big billboard. He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, But do you know what the devil tries to do to you? He tries to sneak up to that billboard at night and spray paint a little asterisk after the lamb. And then put that that fine print on the bottom of the billboard, except for what you did. 
See, the devil is not just the master of deception. He's the master of the exception. And even though we, we can come here and I can preach that the God is a God of love and forgiveness, even though we can sing songs that, that the name of Jesus is wonderful and it's powerful and it's glorious because he's the name above every name and he forgives every sin, sometimes in the quietness of our hearts, we, we think, but you don't know what I did. You don't know what I said. You know, when I was in the struggle with, with that substance, you don't know some of the places I went. You don't know how dark my, my past, maybe even my present is, Pastor. And to that I would say, you, you might be right. I, I don't know. But I do know this. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And so you don't have to be sober to look at the Lamb. You don't have to be good to look at the Lamb. You don't have to be strong to look at the Lamb. You don't have to be anything. To just look. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing that will happen in this place. There's nothing that will happen in our homes that matters more than that. In fact, if there's anything I want you to do today, is just to go home for the rest of this week and do your best impression of John the Baptist. <laughs> Especially for you parents out there. How many parents do I have in the house today? Yeah, a bunch of you. You know, parents, we do like a million things for our kids, don't we? We, we change diapers and we get bottles ready and we prepare meals and we pick up all their stuff and, and we close the, the door when they forget to shut it and we shut off the lights when, the, when they forget to grab them. I see a couple dads nodding at me right now. Right? We drive to practices and we pick them up from practices. We, we discipline. Uh, we pay for, for tuition. We do all these things. But you know what? Nothing, nothing, nothing matters more than imitating John. And saying to the kids that God has put in our care, look, the Lamb of God, Moms and dads, I especially want you to remember that when you're disciplining your kids. You know, sometimes you have to have the hard talk, and, and I know we just want the behavior to be better and, and the choices to be different tomorrow, but nothing will, will change a child like looking at the lamb. Nothing inspires a child to love another human being. Nothing inspires anyone to love another human being like receiving unconditional love from Jesus. And so yes, correct, and yes, let there be a consequence, and yes, discipline, but first, promise me, that you'll do your best, John, and you'll say to your sons and daughters, look, the, the Lamb of God. Hmm. But not just parents. Actually, I hope all of you do that. Uh, there's a lot of things I, I love about this church. Uh, I'd have a long list if I put it on paper. But, but you know, like my number one thing that I love about this place is that we try to be real. Right? We, we form life groups and the goal of our church and those groups is that we wouldn't have to fake it when it comes to faith. Like, however ugly and dark and swirling and intense the, the struggle. Like, we never have to say, we're good and I'm blessed and, you know, pray for my grandma's cancer. Like, we could say, I'm depressed, uh, I'm suicidal, sexually I don't know where I'm at, I don't know if the relationship is going to make it, I, I have a record, I, I used, I, I drank, I, I looked. Like, we could talk about all of that stuff and, and because we want a church like that, there's something so, so important that all of us need to do. And it's not pray, although we should do that. And it's not offer a, a good book or a great podcast, although that can help. The best thing that we can do in a, in a church community that's going to be real is just to say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at Jesus who, who died for sins like that. The most comforting thing we can do is not to, to give good advice to a struggling sinner, but just to tell them the good news that has changed the universe. That Jesus came into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. So look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the entire world, which includes you. That's the first big billboard I want you to stop and see today. Well, there's actually one more before I say Amen. And it, it comes from God himself. Now check out uh, John chapter 1 once more. Uh, John the Baptist is still speaking here. And he says, I myself did not know him, Jesus. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. 
I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on Jesus. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Pretty fascinating, huh? Uh, John the Baptist, who was related to Jesus and who would be like the hype man for the Messiah, he actually said, I, I really didn't know it was Jesus, but God told me. Uh, apparently, if you think of Jesus as like <laughs> this like glowing, kind of floating over the ground, halo over his head kind of guy, he wasn't. Uh, he had calluses on his hands, sandals on his feet, and a beard on his face. He could have walked right by you and you wouldn't have looked at him twice. And, and so God had to put up a billboard. God said, John, I'll let you know who he is. It's the guy on whom you see the Holy Spirit come down like a dove. That was God's ad. If you're taking notes, uh, write this down in your last fill in the blank. Uh, God's ad on Jesus was simply this. Look, the dove. <laughs> Which is terrible marketing, isn't it? The dove. Like, <laughs> if, if you all get, like, gave thousands of dollars today so we could get some extra billboards and I just put a giant dove up on it, would you be mad at me? <laughs> like, come on, pastor. Like, you don't have to be a marketing expert to realize a dove like, doesn't draw people to faith. It doesn't inspire and, and empower people. Uh, but it did with Jesus. If you've read much of Jesus' story in the Gospels, you might know that this actually happened. The Holy Spirit appeared as a dove uh, at this moment, uh, the day that Jesus was baptized. Uh, this next picture here uh, kind of is one artist's depiction that when Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit appeared from heaven like a dove. Uh, the artist here kind of depicted how all of us, uh, as Christian people, are connected to Jesus through his baptism and through ours. But right here prominently, I want you to think about that. Why, why did the Holy Spirit show up like a dove? Did you answer that question? I mean, the Holy Spirit isn't actually a dove. He's a spirit, so he could have appeared as anything over Jesus' head. He could have been a big arrow that would like glow in the sky. He could have appeared as a lamb because Jesus is the lamb of God. It could have been a cross or a crown to show us he's the king of heaven. But the Holy Spirit chose to make a visible billboard as a dove. And if I paid you 20 bucks, could you tell me why? If a pastor would have asked me that question two weeks ago, I would have said, well, because a, like a dove is a symbol of peace, right? To which I now would respond, where'd you get that from? Because it's not in the Bible. <laughs> but you know what it is? I get into some like super deep pastor nerdery uh, this past week and I looked up every single passage in the entire Bible that uses the word dove. Can I tell you about it? I'm going to tell you about it, even if you're totally uninterested at this point. I found out there are 42 uses from cover to cover and, and they're fascinating. All right, let me tell you all the examples and you tell me if you can figure out how it fits to Jesus. The first time a dove shows up in the Bible is in the book of Genesis in the story of Noah and the ark. If you remember, there's like death and destruction. The flood waters come, God's judgment. But then Noah sends out a dove. And the dove comes back with a little leaf in its beak to prove that there would be life after death and there was going to be a future and a hope after God's judgment. Then the book of Leviticus, doves show up again as sacrifices that people would make in church. Except specifically, these weren't sacrifices that rich people could afford. They could bring a lamb. But if you were poor... If you're impoverished and you had nothing, you could bring a dove and it would be right to make you right with God. Then you jump ahead to Song of Songs, that Old Testament poetic kind of romantic book. And it turns out that like a dove, calling a woman a dove, was like an Old Testament way of flirting with her. So um, you guys who are dating, you brought girls here to church today. You can try this after church and let me know. But this guy in the book of Song of Songs would say, my darling, my beautiful, my dove, your eyes are like doves, he would say. Like so captivating and interesting. I just want to look and keep looking. I get lost in your eyes. Uh, then the book of Psalms, King David says he wanted to be a dove so he would have wings and he could fly away from the troubles of life and be at rest. Then in the Old Testament prophets, uh, doves were used as signs of, of mourning and suffering. Have you ever heard of a mourning dove because of the sound it makes? Uh, when you go through brokenness and sin, uh, doves would mourn. And then the New Testament, on the book of Matthew, Jesus said to his disciples that they should be as innocent as 
doves. And you put all those passages together, and do you know what you get? Jesus. You look confused. Let me connect the dots. Um, Jesus was as innocent as a dove. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. Uh, His words were never anything less than loving and true. And yet Jesus suffered like a mourning dove. Uh, He came into this world and he was born in the midst of brokenness. Especially when he went to the cross for the sake of our sins, he, he mourned and grieved like a dove. And on that cross, he was sacrificed like a dove. His blood was shed, but not just for powerful and rich people. Instead, he was sacrificed for those of us who are poor spiritually and have so little to offer God. He would be a sacrifice to make us right. And because of that, we we have the wings of faith. Like when life is hard and broken and we feel like we can't go on, Jesus gives us wings to fly to a place where our hearts can be at rest and where we will see something beautiful. Where because Jesus didn't just die under God's judgment, but he came back with words of life in his mouth, we know that there is hope for us. A hope where we will actually see Jesus. And if you think falling in love and looking into some girl's eyes or being lost in the presence of some guy makes you feel good, you have no idea because Jesus is the dove. And in heaven, you don't look at him for 5.77 seconds and, and then look for your phone. Instead, he's so captivating and glorious and beautiful. You look at him forever and ever and ever. And it never gets old. Which makes the dove the perfect ad campaign. Do you need life? Do you need hope? Do you need glory? Do you need beauty? Do you you need forgiveness? Do you need rest? Well, then look at the dove. (laughs) I think there are a lot of you here today who who really need to know that. I bet there are some of you, and, and I'm not sure who you are, that have had your hearts broken by someone who is not so innocent like a dove. Maybe you're dating that person and and they said you were their only one and then you weren't. And your heart is aching for someone who will make a promise to love you and then will actually keep it. And if that's you, I'd say, look at the dove. Jesus is innocent and he is sinless and he loves you and he'll never change that. Some of you are are, kind of new to to church and Christianity and, and you feel like you... I mean, you just don't know much. You don't have a lot to offer. You're not rich in faith. To which I would say, look at the dove. <laughs> because Jesus is the sacrifice for everyone's sins, not, not just the powerful, popular, long-time Christian. Some of you are aching in your bodies and you're just longing to fly away from this messed up life and find a place where your heart can rest. To which I would say, look at the dove. Jesus once said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some of you have been disappointed by this life. You thought if you got your degree, it would make you happy. You thought if if you made $30,000 a year, you'd be so happy. You you thought if you won the championship, got a 4.0, did whatever, it would make you so happy. And then you got it and it didn't last for very long. And if that's you, I would say, look at the dove. Look at Jesus who is so complex and wise and loving and patient and glorious that you can look at him in this book and, and never get sick of looking. Trust me, I'm, I'm 38 years in and it doesn't get old. No matter what your situation, what, what your struggle, what your guilt, what your shame, look at the dove because Jesus is exactly what you need. Which is what we thought when we finally chose that billboard. Remember our dilemma? We got seven words, six seconds. There's a million billboards in town with with words and pictures of real estate agents. What are we going to put on to get people's attention? How can we get people to take the next step who are like sad and and broken and and grieving and looking for something to put their hope in? Or people who are like angry with life and and frustrated with God, how how can we grab their attention? Or people who just don't know and they're they're curious and they're confused. They've heard of Jesus, but they don't know the real Jesus just yet. How can we connect with people who have all kinds of problems and they might just be looking for answers? Well, here's what we came up with. Emojis. (laughs) We thought if there's one thing we haven't seen around town, it's emojis on a billboard that would grab people's attention and, and hopefully would connect with their hearts, with their grief, their sorrow, their frustration, their curiosity. 
And we picked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words and a logo. And we made sure it wasn't explicitly about church or about God. So no matter what people struggles, no matter what they think spiritually in this moment, maybe they would take a step and look in and find much more than a church. They would find a lamb and a dove and the son of God. And that's why today I don't have any homework for you. You know, normally when you come to church, um, I always put like a, a note, a question, like, Mike, what are you going to make people do? All right, like, what's the, what's the next step? What's the thing they should read? What's the passage they should memorize? What's the class they should take? What should they do at home, at work, at school? But today, uh, that just didn't seem right. Because I didn't want you just to come here and to look at Jesus for this time together and then get back in your car and have to look at some to-do list that the pastor assigned. Instead, here's my simple prayer for you. That you just keep looking. That when you think about today, you would just look at the grace of Jesus. That that when you're done with church and and you look at, at your bulletins on your kitchen tables, you would just think about the love of Jesus. And as you go through this week uh, and you face struggles like we all will, you would just think about the power and sufficiency of Jesus. Because if I make you stand in front of a mirror of another to-do list, it will zap you of life. But if I can put you in front of a lamb or a dove or a cross, you can find the abundant life that Jesus promised. Essentially, I, I want you to feel uh, this week what Charles Spurgeon felt on January 6th 1850. Uh, You ever heard of that name before? Charles Spurgeon is actually one of the most famous Christian pastors of the past 2,000 years. Uh, He was a Baptist who lived in the late 1800s. And as far as I can tell, he was one of the first megachurch preachers. In downtown London, they built a church for Charles Spurgeon where 5,000 people could sit. And every Sunday, more than 5,000 came. They say a thousand people would show up even though there weren't seats and they would stand and listen to this man who was supernaturally gifted and abnormally blessed. And do you know how Charles Spurgeon first became a Christian? It wasn't from his mom and dad. He grew up in in kind of an outwardly religious home, but he had no personal relationship with Jesus until January 6th, 1850. As a 15-year-old, he, he was walking down the street during a vicious snowstorm that had descended on London. And he's trying to meet someone for an appointment, but the weather was so bad he couldn't make it. And so by chance, uh, he ended up stepping into this little Methodist church just as the service was beginning. And the weather was so terrible that only a dozen people showed up for the service that day. In fact, it was so severe that the pastor himself couldn't make it. <laughs> so some random guy from the church Uh, who apparently, as Spurgeon says, wasn't very good at preaching, he got up to preach. And the text he chose was Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Here's what that verse says. Look to me, says the Lord, and be saved. Spurgeon told the story over 260 times in his sermons of what happened next. (laughs) He said... The poor preacher didn't have much to say, thank God, because he wasn't very good. But that compelled him to keep on repeating the passage. Look to me, says God. Look to me, says God. Look to me. The preacher looked out at the dozen worshipers and he said, some of you have been looking at yourselves, but that won't do any good. You will never find comfort in yourself. And so the preacher started to imitate Jesus. Look to me, Jesus said. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look to me, I'm hanging on a cross. Look to me, I'm dead and I'm buried. Look to me, I rise. Look to me, I I ascend. Look to me, I sit at the right hand of God. Look to me, oh, look to me, cried Jesus. And then the preacher looked right at the 15-year-old Charles Spurgeon. And he said to the rest of the church, that young man right there, looks miserable. (laughs) Spurgeon later said, well, I did, but I wasn't used to pastors talking about how I looked during their preaching. (laughs) And the pastor said, young man, you will be miserable in life and in death unless you listen to this word. So young man, look. Look to Jesus. 
Here's how Charles Spurgeon described what happened then. There and then, the cloud was gone. The darkness rolled away. And in that moment, I saw the sun. I could have risen and sung with the most enthusiastic of Christians about the precious blood of Jesus. And as the snow fell on my road home, I thought every snowflake talked with me and told me of the cleansing pardon I had found in Christ. Just look. You don't have to be a member of our church to look. You don't have to have read a page of this book to look. You don't have to be anything to look. Just look at Jesus and you will be saved. Let's pray. Um, Dear Jesus, thank you for being the Lamb of God. Thank you that 2,000 years ago you didn't come to give us a lecture but to show us your love. Thank you that you didn't give us a second chance. Instead, you made one sacrifice that was enough for all of our sins. I pray boldly today in your name, Jesus, against every built bit of guilt and shame. That no matter how ugly or dark, or twisted or embarrassing or shameful the things that we have done or said or thought, that we would leave today with peace. That we would believe what is actually true, that through faith in Jesus, the face of God is looking on us with favor. It's shining upon us and it is gracious to us. And I pray, God, that that message would change us. Simply looking at Jesus, the source of salvation would change us that we could be people of incredible love. I pray, Jesus, for us as a church. Uh, You bless us with, with many years of pointing to you and to your cross. And I pray that we would keep doing it. We live in a culture of marketing, God, that loves three quick tips and and five simple steps, but that will not change human hearts like this one simple message that will never get old to us just to look at you. Uh, Jesus, I I think about people from our church who have passed in recent years. And I think of the expressions on their faces as they look at your face. Uh, I think how interesting, how glorious, how good, and how beautiful you must be if they look and they keep looking and they never want to look at anything else. And I thank you, God, that this is our hope. That no matter how big our struggle, whether we solve our problems today, tomorrow, a decade from now, or never, we have an eternity of seeing your face. Help us to see it even now through the eyes of faith, that we would be satisfied and at peace. I pray this today, Jesus, in your name, because it is wonderful, it is powerful, it's marvelous, and it's enough. So we pray today, Jesus, in your name. Amen.